we're just about an hour away from the season finale of the January 6th committee, back now in prime time. Tonight's episode of Law & Order Special Elections Unit is the season finale, unless they want to have another one. Kind of like a network with lagging ratings might do a Friends reunion show. In other words, they are all going on vacation for August, so is America, but the committee might have one or two more hearings before the election to remind you of just how bad Republicans are because of how bad tre President Trump was and continues to be in their mind. That's not an attack, but just acknowledging the political reality. Just remember, tonight, like all of the committee's public events, aren't hearings. They are carefully scripted episodes. Tonight is going to be about the Capitol riot and what President Trump was doing during the three hours of it. And for tonight's hearing, there is an audience of one. That's Attorney General Merrick Garland. The committee wants him to hear, and more importantly, they want him to know that the world heard all of the bad things that Trump did. The goal here is to give continued pressure over the next month and a half for criminal charges against Trump. The committee cannot bring criminal charges. Merrick Garland can. That's the big difference. He's the one they're talking to. And nothing would be better for Democrats heading into the midterms than criminal charges against President Trump. Here's the attorney general yesterday telling the world that he is indeed watching. No person is above the law in this country. I can't say it any more clearly than that. There is nothing in the principles of prosecution in any other factors which prevent us from investigating anyone, anyone who's criminally responsible uh, for, for an, uh, an attempt to undo a democratic election. As much as Republicans like to deny it, Trump did try to undo a Democratic election. There's tape of him begging Georgia's Secretary of State to find votes. There's tape of him telling Mike Pence not to certify the Electoral College. He peddled conspiracy theories of rigged election machines. None of this is in doubt. It's on tape. We all heard it live in some cases. It's on Twitter. We all knew this. It was all part of the public record long before these hearings. The issue isn't trying to undo a Democratic election. It's the first part of the sentence from the Attorney General that will matter tonight. There is nothing in the principles of prosecution in any other factors which prevent us from investigating anyone, anyone who's criminally responsible uh, for, for an, uh, an attempt to undo a Democratic election. Anyone who is criminally responsible, criminally responsible. That's the standard the committee will try to meet tonight. Tom Dupree is here, former Deputy Assistant Attorney General under George W. Bush. Tom, we appreciate it. Uh, good to see you. I'm not a lawyer. You are. Sarah Matthews, former Deputy White House Press Secretary. Matt Pottinger, former National Security Council member who resigned on January 6th at a protest. They're speaking tonight conceivably about these three hours from when Trump gave his speech to when he sent the tweet telling the rioters to go home. What do they have to say that crosses that criminal responsibility line? Leland, I think these witnesses are going to be testifying about what they observed personally on January 6th, both uh, what they saw the president do or not do, as well as what they saw senior aides to the president do or not do. My sense is that the committee is not so much building a criminal case based on things that the president didn't do during the three hours that they're going to be focused on tonight. I think the significance of those three hours really goes more toward trying to prove his motive for potential other crimes, such as obstructing an official proceeding. And I think the committee's thinking is that these witnesses tonight will help generate evidence to show that the president wanted the riot to happen. He wanted the Capitol to be assaulted rather than this was something that just got out of control or something that happened against his wishes. So this, from the very beginning of the hearing, was how they laid out then-President Trump's seven-part plan, in their words. Spread false election claims, replace the attorney general, pressure Mike Pence, pressure state officials, instruct state officials to lie, summoned mob, ignored pleas to stop uh, violence. 
they claim they, they have and will prove all of these. That's that's up to the uh, viewers and at some point conceivably a jury or Merrick Garland to decide whether they've met him. There's been this whole discussion of dereliction of duty, and that's something we've heard over and over and over again from the committee members. That's from the Uniform Code of Military Justice. That's not a law uh, that President Trump was uh, subjected to, was it? I, to my knowledge, no. I've always thought that that dereliction of duty was a little bit of a stretch. In other words, as you point out, it's something that's typically applied in the military context. I suppose you can make the argument that, well, the president's the commander in chief. But as I said, it's a real stretch. I think if the committee wants to recommend particular charges to the attorney general, they would do better just focusing on the U.S. criminal code, looking at obstruction type offenses and the like, rather than something that they're plucking from the military code. Speaking of Merrick Garland, he just sent a memo a couple of weeks ago. We talked about it on the show earlier this week, instructing uh, U.S. attorneys and other members of the Justice Department that they had to get any investigation of a presidential candidate or a potential presidential candidate cleared by him personally. Uh, we're just about a couple of months away from the midterm elections. Few things would be more explosive than criminal charges either into President Trump or Hunter Biden that could possibly be coming. Are we in the window where any attorney general for his own reputation and for the impartiality of the Justice Department just wouldn't pull that trigger? I think we're getting extremely close to that window right now, Leland. I mean, there is a rule in the Justice Department that you don't bring charges on the eve of an election. I don't think we're quite on the eve of the midterms. I think we're very close. We're not obviously on the eve of the presidential election, but we certainly will be, you know, in the future. I think that's got to be at the top of Merrick Garland's thinking here is that he's up against a time limit. He knows that he needs to pull together whatever evidence he has. And if he wants to pull the trigger on this prosecution, he's got to move soon because the clock is ticking and it's ticking against him. It's ticking against him and in a way it's ticking against the momentum, right? Which is what you sort of have the, <laughs> the unstoppable force and the immovable object meeting here uh, between the political will and then the calendar. Um, you and I talked a lot about Pat Cipollone. I just want to go back to that soundbite of Cassidy Hutchins from the emergency January 6th meeting about the White House counsel. Take a listen. Mr. Cipollone said something to the effect of Please make sure we don't go up to the Capitol, Cassidy. Keep in touch with me. We're going to get charged with every crime imaginable if we make that movement happen. So that movement, uh, President Trump heading to the Capitol with the rioters, didn't happen. Is the reverse true that there's no charges then? Well, I'm not sure you can say the reverse is true. It's, I think it's a much harder case for Merrick Garland to make. I mean, look, Pat Cipollone had a good point, right? If you have the president leading that mob to the Capitol, I think it makes it that much more difficult for the president to say that he was innocent and he didn't do anything wrong. I think Cipollone gave the president very good advice. Does it exculpate him and mean he can't be charged? No, it doesn't. But it certainly makes it a much tougher case for Merrick Garland. So I think the president has Cipollone to thank for keeping him away from the Capitol that day, if in fact that's what happened. What happens next, not necessarily politically, but legally uh, for the committee? Because uh, they can issue their report, they can have more hearings, they can continue depositions. At some point, do they have to present anything to the Justice Department? No, they don't. It's up to them how they want to ultimately present this. Look, they're functioning under a clock, too, right? Because if, as the whole political world expects, the Republicans take the House in the fall, presumably the committee will dissolve. So they know they have to wrap up their work fairly soon. As far as what their work product is, it wouldn't surprise me if they wanted to document it in some sort of formal report. Mm -hmm. That's what I would expect. I would also expect that they would send something over to the Justice Department, possibly with the recommendation. And I would also suspect they're going to have another hearing. I mean, these hearings are, you know, getting a good audience. The committee seems to enjoy putting them on. I think they're going to adjourn for the next few weeks. But is this the last hearing that we're going to see from the January 6th committee? I'd bet against it. Th that, that is saying something. Real quick, uh, we, we saw those pictures of the hearing room. There's a teleprompter. Uh, every question is read. Every statement is carefully scripted. This isn't a typical congressional hearing, unlike anything we've ever seen. Uh, they have hundreds, if not thousands, of hours of depositions of Trump's inner circle, of all sorts of people who were involved on January 6th. You can see the teleprompters facing the committee there. Uh, what happens to all of that? Will we ever get to see the, the full truth of what was told, or is that up to the committee? 
it's up to the committee, but I would be shocked if they didn't put it all out there. I mean, they have gathered so much information. I mean, obviously, they're kind of cherry picking the highlights for purposes of these televised hearings, but they've gathered an enormous amount of information. My guess is what they will do is they will both produce a report that summarizes what they found. And I suspect, I suspect they will also put out just all the volume, the deposition transcripts, the evidence, the video, the text, everything they captured just to put it out there in the historic record. They don't have to, but that's my strong prediction. All right. Hey, Tom, thank you very much. And uh, stand by. We'll see you at the top of the hour heading into the hearing. Thanks, Lily. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your television provider. And don't forget to subscribe. Click the red button to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven unbiased coverage.